Namaste. Welcome to this live session with Dr. David Frawley, whom in India we know better as Sri Vamadeva Shastri. Namaskar. Namaskar. Hariyam. Uh, so, so nice to have you here on Jaipur Dialogues uh, once again. Uh, let me introduce you to the viewers. Uh, most of them already know you because you have been the first speaker in the Jaipur Dialogues when we started in 2016. Uh, <clears throat> Vamadeva Shastri ji is a practicing Hindu Acharya in the tradition of Bhagwan Raman Maharshi. He is based out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, he's house is in the mountains in Santa Fe and that is where you see a little bit of a difficulty in the connection and he's speaking from the, that uh, I can call it a mountain retreat and he is not only an expert in yoga, Ayurved, Jyotisha and many other Indic fields but uh, his scholarship covers almost the entire gamut of Indic thought and one of the first person to challenge the Aryan invasion theory on the basis of Vedic literature. He has authored numerous books. A list uh, would be given when we make the talk on the recorded YouTube. That list will be made public here. And uh, of course, I said that, that he's uh, the oldest speaker in Jaipur dialogues. And Today's topic is a very interesting one. Sir, uh, we have read <coughs> your various books and your take on uh, the various strands of Western thought. And it appears to me from what I have read of the, your writings, your books, that you seem to treat most of the Western thought as a facet of that same concept. Now, if you talk of Marxism and Nazism, I think you have yourself talked about both the things as the facets of Hegel's thought, if I am um, correct, or I may be corrected on that point. So can we discuss uh, about the Marxism and Nazism, Hitler's uh, National Socialism, from the point of view, how the Germanic thought of Hegel proceeded and the racist theories that underlay the Hegel's thought, some of it uh, may have been diluted in Marxism and were not probably diluted in Nazism. Thank you, Sanjay. I'm very happy to be with you. We are in our mountain home. We have only satellite connection here. Uh, it's usually good, but it does come up and down a bit. So I hope that the viewers can see me properly. In any case, we'll have a very good audio about the whole situation. Of course, we live in various trying times where various ideologies and religions are fighting. Now they have a new uh, platform, which is social media besides mass media. Uh, going back in the 19th century, of course, they had the uh, colonial rule, military rule, economic rule, all those related factors. So today there are these additional challenges. And then we must understand that the Indic civilization has very different values and ideas than the Western civilization, particularly of the past few centuries or as it is said uh, that uh, Western civilization is much more Rajoguna and is much more into the outer world, conquest, control, domination, material and political views. And even religion is largely cast in a political view of controlling, conquering, converting the world. So India has faced the onslaught of these ideologies and beliefs for many centuries. In fact, for well over a thousand years, India has been ruled by them politically at certain levels in uh, certain parts of the country for long periods of time. And they've also entered into the Indian educational system and the academia, Marxist uh, media. 
So many people, particularly those who call themselves intellectuals in the Indian context, are taking up uh, a mindset and a worldview that's based upon Western political, religious, uh, philosophical, social thought. Now, in my case, I was exposed to and grew up with the Indic thought starting about the age of 16. So I was able to interrupt my Western education and add to it an Indic or Dharmic perspective that later on became uh, predominant. And so coming out of the West, we had, first of all, this whole uh, colonial assault on India. And this occurred not only at a political level, it also occurred at an ideological level with groups like Indology, with Western supported uh, Indological centers, paying scholars like Max Muller and a whole team going on for decades, uh, rewriting India's history and culture and even retranslating and reinterpreting India's text in a a misleading light relative to Western politics and Western theology. At the core of this is Marxism today. And what we have to remember is that I would say Marxism is the most powerful or the most aggressive, destructive form of colonialism. Marxism is a political economic ideology that arose out of the Western world in the 19th century relative to the industrial revolution. Uh, Marx had a lot of his uh, inspiration from this revolt of 1848. Uh, so it came from a very different era and mindset. There was some Indic influence on the German philosophy at a mystical level, particularly Schopenhauer, but it remained a bit uh, superficial. And Hegel interpreted the world in terms of uh, dichotomies, uh, uh, thesis, synthesis, all of this. Uh, but his whole view had that division duality based and Marx applied that to a political level, us versus them. Uh, he aimed at the dictatorship of the proletariat. I don't know how one dictatorship is necessarily better uh, than another. And he saw human life extending to culture, philosophy, and religion in terms of his political dichotomies. And this extended to viewing uh, religion. Uh, but even though he was fighting against the, you might say, the imperial powers of his age, uh, his worldview was still very materialistic, uh, Western hegemonical, and he was happy with the Western conquest and colonial rule of the Eastern world. He saw that as progress, but he wanted to bring in his Marxist theories and Marxist approach relative to uh, the colonial world as part of it. So it's very interesting uh, today we had this whole uh, basically colonial missionary stereotyped denigration of non-Western civilizations, uh, not only India, but also China and all Native American traditions, uh, Native African traditions, uh, ancient traditions, pagan traditions. They were all kind of thrown out as uh, whether it was from a religious standpoint, uh, Kafir, heretics, heathens, polytheists, idolaters, all the rest of it, or from a political standpoint as being against Western progress, science, civilizational type influence. Uh, so this went on. Now, the interesting thing is that colonial narrative, uh, of course, it's been continued by the missionaries, but that colonial narrative has also uh, been sustained by the Marxist. And so essentially what the Marxist and even the left in India is saying about Hindu Dharma, you can actually uh, see it's almost a direct translation of the old colonial views, backward, superstitious, uh, limited, uh, unscientific, uh, you name it, 
it is all continuing, anti-women, anti-poor, anti-caste, whatever you want. Uh, they are continuing it, and they are then showing themselves as the necessary saviors that India needs to go forward. Uh, and then we saw the same thing in China. China had a horrible cultural revolution that destroyed almost all the temples, all the traditional places of learning, and actually shut down the modern universities for a long time as well, and sent everyone back to work in the fields and to read uh, Mao's Little Red Book. Uh, so China was also experiencing this erasing of its ancient culture, and that still hasn't come back. And places that China has taken rule, like Tibet, They've also aimed at erasing the traditional culture, uh, denigrating it, turning uh, Dalai Lama into a terrorist, and again, making Marxism, communism as the uh, way forward. The only difference is in China, they've continued a strong Chinese nationalism, whereas the Marxists uh, in uh, India have been strongly anti-national or even internationalist or even pro-Chinese nationalist. For a long time, they were very pro-Soviet Union. Now Soviet Union has become Russia, which is embracing its ancient tradition. Uh, the Marxists uh, in India are kind of ignoring uh, what Russia has done and blaming India for trying to do that. So the Western thought, having that dichotomy, having that anti-spirituality, looking at Hindu Dharma through the lens of Western theology and its prejudices, which simply uh, does not uh, fit, uh, trying to make it anti-science, has bred these distortions and turned the people in India, particularly the intellectuals and the media, against their own traditions and making them feel they need to save India by becoming Marxist, socialist, uh, communist, Maoist, Naxalites, who have only bred uh, genocide, cultural destruction, uh, even imperialism uh, throughout the world. So it is a very interesting situation. And for them, Hindus are the enemy, just as for the Chinese, the Tibetans are uh, the uh, enemy. And this ongoing conflict has become very deep. And they want to give the idea they're progressive but actually a lot of the so-called progressives are carrying on regressive colonial concepts and materialistic political views. Uh, the way you describe it, it is very comprehensive, but uh, as I asked uh, right at the beginning, it does seem to be very, very similar to the national socialism of Hitler as also to the present evangelism as it is practiced, that uh, the Marxists want to save all other people from their backward ideologies. And the evangelicals, the Christians, they want to save everybody through Jesus. Yes. So national, national yes. socialism, evangelism, Marxism, they all seem to be cut from the same cloth. Yes. In fact, national socialism was a form of socialism. It didn't necessarily portray itself as belonging to what we could call the right. National socialism and fascism in Italy were, of course, nationalistic movements, but they also had this idea of needing to internationalize, conquer, and control. And they were also very much supported by the church. In fact, there were fascist dictators in South America all the way through the 20th century directly aligned with the Catholic uh, church. And even in Europe, the Germans were allied with the German traditions, both Catholic and Protestant. Swastika was a hook cross that was the Christian symbol for them, not a Hindu symbol. They didn't have any regard for anything Hindu. They did have some sympathy towards their old pagan traditions via Wagner's opera, but like Parsifal, these were Christianized, and the church leaders supported uh, there were, of course, a few who didn't support, but the great majority supported the Nazis and the uh, fascists. And we also have to remember that there was a big alliance between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany uh, from, I think, 1939 to 1941, where 
they partitioned Poland uh, and, of course, destroyed Poland. Uh, the Soviets killed thousands of Polish officers. They had a peace pact. And Stalin also, when the Germans attacked uh, 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 the uh, Soviet Union, Stalin at first didn't believe it because he thought they were allies. So they did have a common agenda for a long time, and they had very common factors of controlling the masses, propaganda, writing of the history books, uh, controlling the media, forced genocide, movement of peoples, and this kind of very, of course, a materialistic view of the German, of course, still had more of a religious base, but there's still the view that they were going to save the world. And they didn't have a regard for anything Indian, Dharmic, or anything like that. They were still carrying on an arm or a wing of the Western tradition. And wherever the communist went, uh, they also brought in all the aspects of Western culture, alienated intellectuals from their own traditions and became against them. For example, even in Southeast Asia, the communists were, of course, anti-Buddhist. Uh, in China, of course, they were strongly anti-Buddhist uh, for a very long period of time. Today, they are supporting Buddhism, but they're really subverting it for their own political aims, not supporting it at a real cultural level. Now, what the missionaries do is the missionaries denigrate traditional cultures in order to uh, convert them. And even though their goal is supposedly religious, they take over power politically, economically, they buy large amounts of land, and then they control the people and the traditions involved, and they destroy their native cultures, uh, turn their people against them. And there's a long history of this all over the world. But unfortunately, people don't realize that this process has not come to an end. Uh, we live in a part of the United States that has a large Native American population. And our Native American friends who live in a village of 3,000 people say there's 19 different missionary groups at work in their particular village. India is the biggest target globally for missionary activity. One, because it is the most populated country in the world, slightly behind China, perhaps. And also because it's the only one that really lets the missionaries in. The Chinese don't let them in. Islamic countries don't let them in. Uh, so the missionaries, instead of uh, appreciating India's tolerance, you might say, have now used that openness to target India for massive uh, conversion, which is happening from Andhra Pradesh to uh, Punjab. And even in, of course, Kerala has been going on for a long time. So all these three ideologies, uh, the Marxist, the fascist, the uh, co colonial and missionary movements have been connected. Sometimes they even ally together. And they have the common goal to remove the native cultures and uh, replace them with a Western culture. Uh, it may be religious, it may be more political, uh, but in the first stage, they want to uh, destroy the native culture so they can come in. And they work by going either after the intellect into the intellectuals, or they also work by uh, money and power. Oh, quite right. They subvert all the native traditions and they subvert the intellectuals and uh, all the other all the other traditions, the traditions that they see as the other. And uh, as far as uh, the United States is concerned and the Hindus in the United States are concerned, I think they seem to be getting it both from the left, which is the Marxists and uh, such uh, outfits, and also from the right, that is the church and uh, the evangelicals and such forces. That seems to be the uh, real uh, irony of the whole situation. And when we're talking of National Socialists, you rightly said the National Socialists were supported by the church. And the church has very skillfully hidden its role. And also the Islamists. Hitler was uh, hailed as a hero in the Islamic world during the Second World War. And uh, one of the foremost uh, operators of that was that uh, uh, Hajj Hussaini, the uh, 
the grand mufti of uh, jerusalem who was sitting in germany most of the time as long as germany was winning and when germany started losing then he fled to egypt and uh, then again found his refuge in his uh, old palace at jerusalem um, so that kind of a situation has always prevailed yes in fact, in the past, the right wing in the West was associated more with the Islamist. And of course, the Germans also were allied with Turkey, the caliphate during World War I. There's a long history of that as well. But now we've had the switch where the left is often allied itself with the uh, Islamist. And here I want to make a point of clarification. The most dangerous group for uh, uh, that's promoting the Islamism is the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood has strong influence with the American media. But we must remember that the Muslim Brotherhood has been rejected by Saudi Arabia and Egypt and a number of Islamic countries uh, as well. So it's not simply a black and white issue. Uh, but it is a case where the Islamist movement is very much allied with the left in the United States and also in Europe. And besides that, there's been a very long history. Of course, there was an alliance of the United States with Pakistan after World War II, just as there was uh, alliance of Pakistan uh, with the British overall. And today, uh, and over the last few decades, the left in America, the Democrats have been more pro-Pakistan. That has been the political uh, problem overall, and that is why, and also pro-China. For example, the Tibetans for all these decades have generally supported the Republicans in America, although they have much ideologically different from them, because the Republicans were more anti-China. So that is the problem on that side. The problem on the right-wing Republican side is the Evangelical Christians make up up to 25%, 20, 25% of the American population, which is a significant amount of the electorate for the Republicans. So on one side, the Hindus have the pro-Pakistani Islamic uh, sympathizing Democrats. On the other hand, they have the uh, pro-evangelical groups that are that like to support the evangelical activity in India, which is a very big thing uh, for them. So it puts the Hindus in a difficult place. In terms of foreign policy, they tend to support more the Republicans, but in terms of their values and ideals, uh, they of course uh, find the evangelicals to perhaps be their more uh, primary cultural enemy. Besides this, you've just recently seen in India, a very curious phenomenon that uh, groups come in as uh, friendly groups, supposedly promoting veganism. And you know that uh, veganism otherwise uh, uh, would have no problems with the Indians because Indians are used to uh, advocating different kind of uh, culinary habits. The issue with this is that there seems, seems to be a subtext of actually undermining the Indian tradition of the cow. And we saw that recently, even for Rakshabandhan, they came up with some uh, hoarding that said, this Rakshabandhan, do not use leather bands or something like that. As if anybody ever uh, used uh, leather bands for Rakshabandhan. I mean, he only used strings, <laughs> cotton strings or silk strings. So this kind of a newfangled subversion, uh, something of the kind that we also see in Tamil Nadu, where the evangelical groups uh, dress up Jesus as Krishna or Jesus as some of the deities, and ultimately they try and win over through deception. So this seems to be a newfangled deception that, that seems to have been set into motion, even though veganism as such would have had no objection with the Indians. Uh, yes, in fact, it's very quite odd because the uh, whole concept of ahimsa comes from India and it comes from traditions of Hindus, Buddhists and Jains in which the care of the cow was the main factor behind the 
uh, ahimsa tradition, not only for the Hindus, also for the Jains. Uh, so this is quite odd. And now, under the guise of Ahimsa, the certain vegan groups are telling Hindus not to have any cows at all, uh, not to take any dairy products, uh, because it's harming to the animals, uh, and to essentially uh, negate the entire cow culture of India, both at agricultural and also at uh, cultural levels overall, uh, which would dis devastate these uh, parts of India economically. And it's also gone so far as to have some of these groups go against Ayurvedic medicine, because Ayurvedic medicine uses lots of dairy products, ghee, uh, milk, cow products, and not only for diet, but also in preparation of medicines, and telling uh, Hindus not to use ghee, and giving the impression that Ayurveda is oppressive to cows because it uses dairy products. And also forgetting the whole history of the compassionate care of the cow from Krishna to uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, beyond. And the fact that cows are at ashrams and temples and treated very well. And that there's also the effort to protect and preserve the desi guy, the cow, the native cows of India and their uh, breeds. And then the same groups that are criticizing Hindus as not being, uh, as violating ahimsa by taking care of cows are very soft on Muslims, even for Eid, uh, which slaughters hundreds and thousands, if not millions of goats. And what I found from going over it, uh, these groups will attack like Jalika to, uh, as a uh, oppressive of, of cows or bulls, because of the cow uh, racing uh, involved, cows are not, uh, bulls are not actually killed. Uh, but so what their logic is, is that they say they do not criticize directly religious festivals, which Eid is, but Hindu cultural festivals like Jali Katu or even Diwali, you can go after them because they are not religious festivals, they are simply cultural festivals. So they've kind of removed any religious spiritual sanction for uh, Hinduism, and given that to cultures that eat meat. They even made the Pope their person of the year, uh, even though he uh, uh, clearly eats meat and even veal, supposedly, uh, and that the Catholic Church has no uh, qualms about promoting uh, a meat diet. Raised a Catholic, we were told to eat fish on Fridays. That is far as we went towards uh, vegetarianism. So that hypocrisy is there that they are supporting powerful groups in the Western world that are trying to convert Hindus, even though they eat meat. And they're criticizing Hindus and trying to undermine the Hindu traditions for the care of the cow. Cows should be treated well. I'm not supporting factory farming and manipulation, genetic, manipula genetic manipulation of cows, but this is ridiculous to target the Hindus. In fact, you could take the opposite standpoint that let's work together to promote uh, vegetarianism in various uh, ways. And it is true that you can raise cows in a very compassionate way and produce very high quality food and medicine. And you should be as a natural, supporting natural systems, you should support Ayurvedic medicine, the world's largest, oldest natural healing tradition that doesn't, that emphasizes, that gives a place for vegetarianism, rather than uh, shutting it down. What are people going to go to? Modern medicine, drugs, you know, uh, nutritionists who tell them to eat meat or all the rest of it. So there's a lot of hypocrisy there. And part of it is because the people running these organizations have not studied the Indic tradition at all. Not only those who don't come from India, which are still running most of the organizations, but those who are raised in India, they become secular missionaries against their own culture, and they pontificate against their own culture, and they tend to kowtow to the Western groups, including Marxist missionaries, Islamist uh, leftists that don't actually support them on the dietary level either. And there's many such of these secular missionaries uh, working on various issues uh, on the India side that do have a, a perhaps political motive, but certainly a cultural bias and a cultural agenda to subordinate or replace India's traditional cultures 
with their version of civilization or culture from the West today. You're quite right. I think that's a very good term to use, secular missionaries. I would also request my viewers that uh, uh, if you're liking this episode, please do like, subscribe, and share. And also, do not hesitate to ask questions. Vamadev Shastri ji is with us even after the talk finishes. And you can ask your questions through Super Chat. So keep firing the questions. So uh, uh, let us uh, put it uh, in another way, because it is very clear that the entire effort is for subversion of the Indian culture, because it appears that they seem to think that this is the last bastion left to be conquered. Everything else they have conquered. They have destroyed all the civilizations, all the ancient civilizations. And this is the only one left standing. And it's not only left standing, it's left standing very big. So that seems to rankle in the eyes of all these, I would say, supremacist groups. Because each of these is a supremacist group, whether it is Islamists or this is a, a Christian evangelists or even normal Christian groups, the church, uh, as well as Marxists. So there seems to be some kind of an alliance among all these three. The supremacist groups against a very, very tolerant group called the Sanatanis, who are mistakenly called Hinduism or protagonists of Hinduism. That as soon as that word ism comes, uh, comes that question of that polarization. And I would uh, <clears throat> also request you to throw light on the kind of resistance that these people are facing and that makes them very uncomfortable and that makes them uh, go after the Sanatan Dharma with even greater vigor. Well, it's very interesting to note that most of Europe has abandoned Christianity. Uh, even countries like France and Italy, the churches are more tourist and museum pieces than actually used. In fact, the most religious country in Europe that we saw was Russia, where you did have people going back to their uh, traditional churches and all of that. Otherwise, Europe has pretty much given that up. In the United States, the evangelicals are regarded as a backward force, and they are also criticized at a social and political level within media, academia, and all of that. The strange thing is they are often still supported at a level of foreign policy. For example, the New York Times that criticizes the evangelical vote uh, does support NGOs of an evangelical nature working in countries like India. So I've asked some of these people why they do that. And their actual answer was very simple because they said it's a spread of Western civilization. And we feel if they come in, uh, we can come in after them. So the evangelicals are being accepted as a wing of foreign policy. And some of the people there under the guise of evangelical activity are actually business people using the missionary rules and nonprofit religious status to accumulate wealth and power. Uh, so this is, this is going on. And the other thing we've seen, which is quite odd, is that the history books throughout the world have largely been rewritten in the post-colonial era, giving a much more positive view of the colonially ruled cultures. Like there's been the new history of Africa. There's been the new history of the Americas telling how the, you had an advanced civilization and that it was destroyed and uh, desecrated. Native Americans were not savages, they were very, uh, cultured, aware, uh, earth-connected, certainly, and sensitive uh, people. But to put that in a local context here, too, even though they've done that, I have to say the Native Americans are still one of the most highly oppressed people uh, in the United States today, deprived of almost any type of political or economic uh, representation. So this has been an ongoing issue that the West has moved in, a, in an area it considers to be progressive, but instead of honoring the native cultures per se, they think being liberal is trying to make native cultures become people of the left and embrace Marxist socialist ideas and throw away 
uh, their own uh, traditions. There are movements to preserve these traditions that are going on. There are movements uh, within uh, India where this is happening, uh, but the struggle is still there. And the secular leftist missionaries, Marxists, are definitely carrying on the colonial agenda with a vengeance and with a new power of media. And they seem to have plenty of money because the technocrats seem to be behind them. And the richest people in the world today are not the old right-wing industrialists, but they are the new uh, technocrats that no longer have that uh, political allegiance. Yes, that's what they call that mullah missionary Marxist media axis that works actively against uh, not just the Indian tradition, but I think in all uh, universe or other or throughout the world, they keep acting against the native traditions. And here we have in India a very sticky point as far as the rewriting of history is concerned. Even after the rise of the Dharmics uh, after 2014, that is one issue that has not been addressed and people are quite cross about it, even with the present government as such. Uh, in this context, there are two little issues that uh, I would uh, like to discuss with you towards the end. Once again, reminding our viewers that uh, we are coming to the end of this uh, talk from Dr. David Foley, and he can take questions if you ask them. Uh, till now, very few questions have been asked. There is this issue of this newfangled feminism. And uh, also, we've seen the kind of a, a destructive movement like Black Lives Matter, which has been completely taken over by these uh, four M's, the Mullah missionary Marxist. I think as far as the US is concerned, probably it would not be right to add missionaries to it. But definitely the Mullah Marxist media access is working even in the US and in um, India, you can add missionaries to that as well. Definitely. And uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a nexus based on one level of convenience because actually the Marxist and the Mullahs have opposite values in terms of human rights, religion, and these different factors. So it is an alliance versus a common enemy rather than a common ideology. And we've also find some of these groups going against their own ideologies, like the feminists supporting the burqa as a symbol of freedom for Islamic women, whereas in the Islamic world, the burqa, which is largely an Arabic thing, not something common to all the Islamic uh, cultures, is regarded as a symbol of oppression of women. So this is a strange alliance that we see, and it's one that is based upon this concept that go against your enemy, and if somebody's your enemy, anybody against them is going to be your friend. Uh, so that is what we see. There are legitimate issues of racism in America. There are legitimate issues of women's rights. There are important ecological issues. There are important issues of religious discrimination. All these things are there, but when you take them out of context and kind of turn them into a kind of social disruption movement, then you're moving out of the field of dialogue and discussion, and it's becoming kind of a, a new kind of semi-revolutionary uh, movement. And I don't want to go into the details of it. It is rather complex at this particular point. But you, are, you have a legitimate idealism that can easily be hijacked. And that's what happens with a lot of these groups. Marxism had its point of view, oppression of the poor, oppression of the lower classes. You need to, to address that. But the way they had addressed it was not making it better, but in fact, in some ways, making it worse. That's right. And uh, just one little outlier in this whole discussion. Uh, there is at least one ancient civilization that uh, uh, I can see, which has very successfully managed these contradictions, has also modernized and become a very, very prosperous nation, and has also managed to preserve its traditions. And that is Japan. 
how does japan manage it uh japan is very interesting first of all japan was the only main country in asia that threw the missionaries out in the 17th century and essentially never let them come back in again uh in the in the 19th century they brought in western science and economics and even military factors but they didn't bring in the religious missionary side in order to do that in fact they uh, supported their own tradition some could even say they went too far japanese imperialism but they did not uh give up their traditional culture at any particular point and so that's one reason why the japanese and they were never under direct colonial rule that has also uh saved them India has also preserved its culture to a great extent even though it's been under foreign rule educational distortion media distortion because it is so deep seated in the civilization going back for thousands of years and in the whole all the dharmic civilizations you cannot define them by right and left in terms of western politics you cannot define them by western theology of god and the devil and heaven and hell and uh sin and salvation you cannot define them according to the dichotomies of western thought sacred versus uh profane science versus religion and so uh when you bring in these outside ideas you breed distortion and so india has to reclaim its dharmic approach and its own civilizational uh terminology uh india has to ally with various countries throughout the world modi i think has better relations with a variety of leaders throughout the world than any other uh head of state uh but this is not going to fall into the western categories of right and left and uh the certain issues and the other problem is then india is judged by the current conflicts within western civilization american politics european politics as if these should define india when india with its different civilizational model transcends them and can help the world to transcend these uh destructive dichotomies that continue to breed uh violence warfare and just uh cultural denig denigration overall thank you for uh, this discourse and now we'll take up questions and uh, the first question and the questions will flash on the screen uh, i will also read them out uh, <clears throat> you so the first question is from anam that is without name why bharatiya civilization making same mistakes over and over again and doesn't develop counter narrative effectively yes that's a very important question and of course this problem has been going on for many centuries and then of course the british also infiltrated and distorted the educational system and then the neruvians i have to say are also a colonial and a western uh force the neruvians only paid lip service to the indian civilization and culture they mainly promoted socialism they had a soft spot for christianity evangelicals even mullahs uh even uh islamists to some degree uh, so they did not uh in fact when the neruvians took power they shut down the indian independence movement which had produced these critiques like shri arabindo and uh tilak and tagore and so many but they shut those down and instead uh they created a view in which the marxists the communists the soviet union the chinese were the allies and were given support and the neruvians looked down upon their own traditions or they took what little uh they could remake in their own image uh they honored india as culture and art but not as a living spiritual tradition so that problem has been there but still i think there's been a lack of will at a ground level and also division within the indian uh society uh different states and a fear also perhaps of foreign bad press retaliation for indianizing uh 
India. <clears throat> For example, when Babri Masjid was taken down, it was called the end of a 5,000 year Ahimsa culture uh, in India. Not to mention that, I don't know, 100,000 temples were destroyed, genocide massively had gone on, British orchestrated uh, famine. Uh, how, is, how, is, how were all those things a continuation or a part of an Ahimsa tradition or something not to be uh, challenged? And so the power of the media is there. And also the intellectuals in India are highly Marxist. And they read the New York Times. They'll even read Shakespeare, but not Kalidas. They'll read the Bible, but not the Vedas. And they will pride themselves as, belong, as following the latest trends in Western uh, psychology or politics, <clears throat> rather than studying the deeper yoga Vedanta traditions of their own uh, country. There has been some improvement of a Hindu awakening, of a Bharatiya awakening, but it has a long ways to go. One could argue it may take more time, but the effort needs to be made and the media educational poison uh, has to be challenged and stopped because that can infiltrate and destroy the coming uh, generation because it's controlling the means of knowledge, not just what is said and it's controlling where people go to for knowledge. Uh, you can find all about uh, Yoga Vedanta on Google. Uh, you have to study teachings, you have to practice, you have to go to temples. So this is a big problem and it needs to continually be addressed and uh, challenged. That's quite right. I mean, so counter, building counter narrative is a, is a long and arduous task after all. The narratives against the Dharmic civilizations have been patronized and have been going on for almost 200 years. And uh, I think the awakening is only a few decades old. I think uh, probably started with uh, uh, Sita Ram Goyal and Ram Sarup. And uh, you also collaborated with them a great deal at that point of time. And uh, uh, their work seems to have. Uh, benefited the people who have come on a little later and we are reaping that benefit and I think trying to string up some kind of a counter narrative. The next question, uh, this is Kapil Chauhan. He says, debating with friends about ancient Indian science being ahead of today's Western science uh, with, uh, for example, the Mallory pillar, etc. It becomes me versus rest. How to convince today's generation about our civilization? Okay, that's a very important point. And what we can say is that a lot of what has become science has its roots or origins in the Indic tradition, whether it is the decimal system, whether it is the zodiac of 360 degrees, uh, whether it is a lot of the astronomical knowledge, uh, that the earth moves around the sun, uh, whether it is uh, medicine, including plastic uh, surgery, uh, whether it is a lot of the uh, sophisticated forms of mathematics, and not only that, linguistics, uh, metrics, uh, music, architecture, sculpture, all these things. You had a tremendous development in India that was often far ahead that of the uh, Western world. That being said, I, I can't say that the ancient people in India had airplanes or they had the technology we have today, but they did have an understanding of the universe which was very important. And the point I like to raise is that there is one science in which India has always excelled the rest of the world by leaps and bounds, which is the science of consciousness. And we could say the science of consciousness is the most important science. Only in the Indic tradition, including Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, do you have a mapping of higher states of consciousness uh, all the way through subtle planes, other worlds, astral, causal, saptaloka, uh, different deity realms, all the way to transcendent uh, universal states of consciousness, various types of uh, samadhi, an experience of the mind, the buddhi, chitta, manas, ahankara, panchakoshas, five sheaths, 
you have an understanding through the science and practice of meditation, mantra of consciousness and our human connection with the universe as a whole, that even modern science is just now starting to take glimpses at and move very slowly uh, towards. Modern medicine is still chemical based, but the uh, Hindu traditions understands the universal prana, prana of nature, uh, prana from the sun. Uh, we also have the concept and understanding of karma and rebirth, not just one life for uh, the soul or not just the human being as a physical creature, a chemical complex, a uh, you know, a, a complex of tissues and uh, organs. So in terms of the science of consciousness, that is the science of the future, and that is where uh, Indic traditions have a tremendous amount to offer. History of science should be rewritten relative to its Indic uh, contributions. It was never a question of Arabic uh, numerals. And even astronomy, they say, oh, the Hindus got their astronomy from the Greeks. But it doesn't work very well because the Greeks and the Romans didn't have the decimal system that the Hindus use for calculation which is much simpler, and the mathematics that the Hindus used to plot astronomical positions came from their own mathematics, not borrowed by the Greeks and the Romans. So these are a few factors involved. That's quite, quite right. In fact, uh, I might uh, like to tell viewers that uh, we are exploring the knowledge and wisdom of uh, Vamadevji only superficially. His real wisdom lies in the realm of yoga and consciousness, which if uh, there is a strong demand, only then we will go because that's a very difficult subject. It's not easy. And uh, he addresses it from the point of view of experiential pramana, the pratyaksha pramana of experience. That's not very easy to have for most people. Next question. Uh, how are you seeing vegans theory linked with PETA? Well, uh, PETA, you know, the People's uh, for the Protection of Animals, uh, has been closely allied with the, uh, the vegan movement and has been promoting the vegan movement. Of course, we say they've been promoting in a selective way and by uh, degrees, depending upon uh, which culture, which country they are working with. And uh, they're, they've been putting this almost religious idea that anyone who takes dairy products as violating the vegan principles is on par with somebody who eats meat and all the rest of it. So that has been there. Uh, there's also a huge commercial uh, vegan uh, movement. I won't go into that here. We don't have time. Uh, but there are also various dietary movements based upon these things that are that can be questionable in terms of what they are offering, not because it's vegan, but because of the food types or food combinations they may uh, recommend. So vegan has become almost a religious cause for a certain people. And we have to understand that what's necessary is raising consciousness for humanity. Proper care of animals is an important part of that but there's also the honoring of native traditions, uh, protection of ecology, protection of natural healing uh, traditions throughout uh, the world. Uh, you know, the Tibetans live at, uh, a lot of them live, you know, at uh, what, 4,000, 5,000 meters, uh, so that uh, vegetarian food is very difficult for them. Are we going to throw out Tibetan Buddhism because it is not uh, vegetarian. So there are other issues involved, and we need a broad, holistic view of the challenges to humanity. The Western view is generally to become fanatic about a particular cause uh, and, and then divide humanity on that particular cause line. Uh, those who worship God versus atheist, monotheist versus polytheist, uh, Marxist, versus uh, fascist, uh, Democrats versus uh, Republicans, you know, true believers versus non-believers. And of course, there are many shades and divisions that can go on here, but that creates a kind of intellectual, emotional, narrow-minded exclusivism 
and fanaticism that does often re resort to either intellectual or even uh, physical violence, as well as political, social, and cultural aggression. So that is what we want to avoid. Otherwise, you can say, okay, you're a mediator. There's no point in talking to you. Everything you say is discredited. You're against this section of society, therefore you're finished. Your ancestors were against this section of society, therefore you have nothing that you can say. We need an open dialogue in which all points of view are discussed and in which we can articulate not only our own point of view, but even the point of view of our opponents to see where they are coming from. The goal is to discover a universal truth, not simply to take a particular faction and then have that faction as the last word on everything else that is going on. And that is the more universal approach we have in Dharmic traditions, which ask us also to meditate, not just simply to uh, go out and proselytize or uh, seek votes, however important these things may be in certain contexts. I take the next question. Uh, this is Prasad Shetty. He's asking, can we call Indian left liberals as Indian right? Because they don't follow a book and they are ready to accept changes which are good to society. Um, well, Indian left liberals are, first of all, generally Marxist, communist, or at least radical socialist. Uh, they are far to the left of the left liberals in the United States, although they are trying to infiltrate them uh, at this particular uh, point. Uh, we shouldn't call what's happening in India in terms of the Western political uh, dichotomies. But much of the so-called left in India is very different than certain liberals outside of India. For example, on the left in India, to show that you're liberal and not culturally intolerant, you have to ceremonially eat meat in front of a group of your peers, particularly beef, to show you have no uh, prejudice. So that's very different than the vegetarians in the West who tend to ally themselves more with the uh, left. Left in India is also generally not in favor of ecology, particularly uh, if it's going against them uh, politically. Uh, the Sitaram Yachari said yoga is something that dogs do, so why should we have to do it? Uh, so it's very interesting that a lot of their views would be regarded as right-wing in the West, and they are authoritarian, they are intolerant, they don't allow other points of view. Uh, they change, you know, the whole Marxist way of education was to control uh, education. And so we could call them right-wing, but we can definitely call them dictatorial, authoritarian, anti-Dharma, uh, for sure, and also uh, even uh, disrespectful of their own traditions. And in the Indian context, they tend to be anti-national, uh, whereas we say in the Chinese context, they may be pro-national in an aggressive sense. We may not like that nationalism. I'm not saying nationalism is always good, uh, but a lot of the left uh, in India still kowtows to China and would love to have the Soviet Union back if they could and uh, tries to tell people in India that Marxism is still alive in the world where it's become lost and it's very much a uh, fringe group. So we have to understand these people directly. Urban Naxalites is a good term, uh, urban Maoist. Uh, I'm not saying we should just reduce people to a label or a name, but they have to come under scrutiny as well. Uh, in fact, so some of the scholars who claim to be left liberals when they come to America are quite uh, vocally pro naxalite and uh, members of the Communist Party in India. They don't tell people that when they give their talks at American uh, universities. And the model of history writing they use is coming from the far left in the West. It's not coming from any Indic uh, tradition 
or any respect for uh, the Indic tradition overall. It's a continuation of colonial historical ideas and perceptions. Uh, next question. Ray Patson from Australia, I guess. How can India stop Marxist anti-capitalist feminism from destroying the family unit like they did it in the West? There is a rise of divorce and 498A misuse in India too. Yes. In fact, you know, there's this statement in uh, Hindu Dharma Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that even the politicians like to quote, the entire world is one family. And I have to tell them in the United States, the family is almost gone. Uh, I would say probably uh, half the children are being raised in single family units, uh, or at least a third. And even those who are raised in family units, the parents, they don't see so much of their parents. And family units can have different structures than a male or a female or a father and a mother. So the family has been undermined. And now the family, the kitchen, uh, cooking at home, uh, eating at home, or even having a home. Uh, people are living more in apartments where they don't have a home. And the younger generation is now not getting married, marrying later, or not having children or uh, getting divorced, multiple partners, not only in the United States, but also in Europe in a very big way. And when the family system is taken down, the nuclear family, first the extended family went, then the nuclear family went. When this occurs, you only have two things left, the individual and the state. So a lot of the individuals today in the West who do not have family connections or family support or a small family, socialism is becoming more a good idea for them because they don't see any other place of getting support and protection. But if you just have the individual and the state, the state quickly becomes a control mechanism, if not a dictatorship. Even if you have a democracy, the leaders can make uh, unilateral uh, judgments as to how you can act and the state can dictate your medical care, your education, uh, what you do in your home, uh, textbooks, uh, media, food, and everything else. So that is what we are seeing. So what we need to do in the Indian context is to protect the culture, cultural diversities, whether it is families, extended families, uh, religious sampradayas, uh, temples, uh, cultural movements uh, overall, because otherwise uh, the steamroller of technology will just simply create it, the individual in the media, the individual in the state. So today, even in democracies, the media and the state have powers that even dictatorial uh, countries in the past couldn't achieve because of the technological power they have and that can continue uh, to grow. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I don't think technology is necessarily bad. I do think the state has responsibilities to care for people at various levels and to protect the ecology. But at the same time, society as an organic structure needs not just the individual, it needs family, extended family, uh, community, it needs sections of society that flourish, whether it's artists, whether it's uh, mystics, whether it's craftsmen, so many things. So we need a healthier social order, and that is what we are losing today. Uh, next question. Okay, this is from Canada. Greetings from Canada. Was Mrs. Gandhi good for India? She is viewed as a nationalist, but was a miscalculationist. I don't know what that means. Who was the best of all Gandhis? After Modi, who will take this forward? This momentum needs to be kept up. Well, first of all, relative to uh, Indira Gandhi, you do have to interpret her 
in the context in which she lived and the time period in which she lived. And she was able to save India from Chinese American influence and uh, Pakistan, uh, the problems that were coming up there. On some levels, she did support the traditional culture, whether it was her gurus or her going to temples, all of that. But at another level, she sold out the educational system to the Marxist. She sold out the foreign policy to the Marxist allied with the Soviet Union, not so much allied with China, although that came later on uh, in the Congress uh, dynasty per se. She also set up Congress as a dynasty rather than a political party. And uh, she took over dictatorial powers during the emergency. And then she gave people the idea that India was a dynasty. The Gandhi Nehru family had the right to rule and uh, their views represented the ultimate uh, truth. They cast that shadow on the country. Uh, since then, of course, they have lost power. We still have the shadow of the Gandhi dynasty, the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, trying to survive. It's very difficult because they have someone who lacks the motivation or perhaps the intelligence or the interest uh, to do it. And anyway, a dynasty doesn't have a place in democracy. India is the most dynastic of the democ democracies. And with 1.3 billion people, you have to have a better representation at a national level than a single uh, family. So there is a movement to go forward. Narendra Modi has done quite a bit. He did uh, inherit an economy that was uh, pretty much destroyed, an educational system that was undermined, a bureaucracy that uh, was highly uh, compromised. Unfortunately, today there is an, there's this terrible pandemic that is compromising what can be done at economic and uh, other levels. But at the same time, I think as time goes on, there is more room for this uh, revival of the deeper traditions of India, which are not hostile to higher knowledge or modern knowledge or even science technology. They just want to see those used in a more dharmic way and a less politically uh, divisive way or as the vehicle for various uh, vested interest groups. But we have take, to take the situation very seriously, particularly at educational and media levels and address the problems. And that is going to call, take a lot of national will. Uh, India, after all, has a population greater than all of Africa. It has one sixth the population of the world. It has various states with uh, certain governments and points of view. So there are many challenges, but it will go forward and a greater effort needs to be done at all levels, whether it's economic, political, educational, and spiritual. And don't worry about what other people are going to say. If you worry about the New York Times, if you worry about the BBC, they'll put you back in a colonial uh, uh, yoke and uh, they will continue to control and denigrate. How can they be, after British induced famines, the British should just be quiet about India. Uh, New York Times uh, was actually supporting, uh, was against the Indian independence movement and supported people against that. So they should also be quiet. They've also been supporting Pakistan uh, for uh, quite a long time uh, as well. So have more confidence, go forward and change things. When it's Ram Mandir is coming up, it's not going to go down again. But if you keep the issue going for 70 years, it just becomes a problem. Be more decisive, act more quickly. Don't worry about what the foreign media that doesn't like you have to say anyway. And the world honors those who are bold and strong and self-confident. Even one reason China is doing well is not because it's kowtowed to uh, Western capitalism, but because it has tried to uh, subvert it from its own point of view. We may not agree with Chinese nationalism and imperialism, but at least uh, they uh, have uh, used a certain cultural strength. India has the same cultural strength that needs to use it in a more positive dharmic way. 
Uh, that's right. Uh, I just have one observation on this is that one of the weaknesses of the Dharmics has been that they seek to get the approval of those very forces that are denigrating them and that are subverting them. That seems to be a long term weakness. Yes. So we go on to the next question. Uh, this is yes, Should Hindu raise the issues of uh, Pasmanda Dalit Muslims? Actually, Pasmanda means backward, so uh, it's not exactly Dalit Muslims. So you must understand, the, I'm addressing the person who's asked the question, that it is Ashraf, the Ashraf class, the Ajlaf class, and the Arzal class. And the Ashraf class are those, uh, traditionally, those who trace their lineage from the Arabs and Persians and Turks, and also the upper class converts. And they are about 5%, and the rest of them are all Pasmanda. That is backward, and uh, the Arzals are still treated as untouchables in uh, most Islamic societies. So uh, should the Hindus raise the issue of Pasmanda Muslims who were discriminated by Ashraf Sayyid, upper caste Muslims, or Muslims of foreign descent? This is one by two. So there is the a second part as well. I think there is, okay. is there a second part? No, there isn't. Okay. That's the question. Okay. Well, first of all, I think it's important that this uh, we change this uh, dialogue and debate about rich and poor and caste and non-caste. Uh, in India, there's often this idea that the India, the poor people all oppressed by rich Brahmins. I remember coming into an airport many years ago, and one of my... Uh, uh, as America nearby made the comment uh, when a reporter came and picked up somebody's bag that this must be a backward class person and the Indian who made him carry the baggage must be a Brahmin. Uh, so these are distortions. Brahmins are also among the poor. Uh, a lot of the rich people include a lot of socialists and leftists, by the way, as well as inherited wealth of Gandhi people, Luttons, Delhi. Uh, so there are issues of rich and poor, educated and uneducated in society, but we have to put them in the proper context, which is not simply religion and caste. Uh, there are Dalit groups that need to be supported. There are Dalit issues that need to be supported, but it's not a Brahmin versus Dalit issue. All over the world, we have issues of the rich and the poor, or educated and uneducated, or even sometimes now, the poor may be more educated than the rich and it doesn't help them. Uh, there are many issues that come up here, but they have to be addressed across the board uh, with a single formula, raising the poor, increasing education. When you reduce it to identity politics, and then you turn one identity against another. Uh, for example, socialism. Socialism has always said that the rich should be held accountable and made to pay for the poor. The problem is economics doesn't work that way. Economics requires that you create jobs and you create wealth. Certainly you need to distribute it better, but the simple distribution of wealth doesn't uh, create wealth. I remember some years ago, I think it was the president or prime minister of Singapore who made the remark, he said, yes, it is better to divide the pie more equally, but you also have to have a larger pie. Uh, shrinking the pie, dividing it up more equally uh, is, is not going to help uh, anyone. And blaming the rich for the condition of the poor. Uh, Indian tradition is one of Lakshmi or abundance. Abundance must be uh, created. And it's very important that abundance is shared so the wealthy have a responsibility of uh, charity, for sure, helping with education, uh, all of that. But at the same time, uh, creating a positive economy, creating positive jobs. There is not a single successful socialist state in the history of the world. I challenge anybody to prove that otherwise. The ones that became successful were because they had some degree of capitalism or positive economic uh, influence. Even China had to uh, remove a lot of its socialist communist regulations to improve itself at a business uh, level. So we need good business skills and a shared economy. 
and concern for everyone, but not dividing it up in terms of these uh, uh, dichotomies, uh, which end up causing problems overall and prevent uh, the real economic development from occurring for all. Okay, so uh, we take up the next questions. We've still got four more questions to go. Uh, so we, I'll ask them quickly. Uh, the next question is uh, VK Gorg, can a not non-native Hindi speaker change uh, Hindu phobic? Hmm, I don't really understand the question. Can a non-native Hindi speaker change Hindu phobic? Um, does he mean, does it, can a non-native Hindi speaker change Hindu phobia in other people? Mm, okay, uh, there's a clarification. Maybe, he says that sometimes people take outsiders more seriously. So can a native uh, Hindi speaker uh, address Hindu phobia better than a non-native uh, outsider? Uh, that's what the question seems to be. Well, I would say it depends upon the speaker and the uh, ideas. Uh, there is certainly a lot of articulate uh, Hindi speakers uh, who have addressed these issues and can address uh, these issues. It is true that in the Indian context, there is a listening to people from uh, the outside, foreigners, perhaps myself in some context. I will also have to say in the spiritual and healing realm in America, being an Indian or a Hindu with brown skin is an advantage for you in the uh, marketplace. And that's also true in other countries where yoga, Ayurveda have uh, spread. So many countries, there's this honoring or listening to people from the outside. I think in cases like myself, but this is also cases of a lot of Indians, is that a lot of these views were not put together in an easy to understand English format. Uh, except in, in the, over the last few decades, that's slowly occurred. And then even in the media, instead of bringing someone to uh, speak on the Hindu view in, in, in and in an easy to understand English, they brought someone who had a muddled English or uh, half Hindi. And so the people tended to associate the intelligence and articulation, unfortunately, uh, with the English uh, medium. And that is why some of the individuals who can present Hindu Dharma, Hindu phobia, whatever else it is, in a good uh, collect, uh, contemporary English idiom uh, may have another audience, particularly an audience of younger people or those more trained at a university level in the English idiom. So that does need to be addressed. And I've also had to tell a lot of Indians that you are bringing into an English idiom uh, inappropriate terms. Uh, don't use terms like God, salvation, sin. Karma is a term used globally, use karma. Uh, talk about self-realization, Atman, uh, Brahman. Uh, don't use terms like sin and scripture and uh, all religions are the same. And, you, and allow uh, traditional terms. Don't say I'm of the left or I'm of the right. We have terms of dharma, adharma. Uh, so bring the Sanskrit into the English. Uh, which is a Chinmayananda did very well. And also it's happening to some extent uh, globally, as we have uh, said, and challenge these uh, distortions. A lot of the distortions, the missionary rhetoric against uh, Hinduism or the Marxist rhetoric is because they're using Marxist dichotomies or missionary uh, dichotomies, you know, uh, Marxists are trying to use caste warfare instead of class warfare. And missionaries are still saying, you know, heathens and idolaters, or at least uh, people who are not sophisticated monotheists the way uh, they are. So the language issue needs to be addressed and the Hindu Dharma needs to be, be presented well, not only in English, but in all the dialects of India as well, with the respect for the Sanskrit idioms and the study of the great gurus of India, many of whom have very good English like Sri Aurobindo or uh, Vivekananda, Chinmayananda, uh, Swami Dayananda, Varshavidya, so many. Uh, so that all needs to be addressed overall. Uh, next question. Next question is uh, Shankar Kumar Chatterjee. 
So what is at the root of the morbid fear of the West? Evangelists, Marxists, Islamists, harbor, uh, sorry, uh, I say, I say, what is at the root of the mor morbid fear that the West, the evangelists, Marxists, Islamists, harbor for our dharmic way of life? Whether it is Hindu phobia yeah. or Hindu misia? Well, I would not call it fear. I would say it is aggression. It is a bold aggression because India is vulnerable and Hindus have not fought back again proper against that properly. And Hindus have created silly ideas like all religions are the same that tends to disarm them. So Hindus are an easier target. And then in the Indian context, the Indian intelligentsia uh, got taken over by the left and stopped defending its own country. And so there was another way for these uh, forces to get in. So they're not afraid of it. Now, the main problem they have with India is that the Indic model of civilization uh, is something that uh, bothers them because it's outside their sphere of influence. And when people in the West start taking up Indian systems like yoga, Vedanta, Buddhism, uh, that bothers them quite a bit. So if they have a fear of Hinduism, it's more at a metaphysical uh, level or at a cultural civilizational level, India as a whole. Uh, but many of the people are not sophisticated. They just feel that we'll be aggressive and get India. If we don't, somebody else will. Uh, and their, their distortions are hateful. I mean, they are a racist or they are religious uh, prejudice. Uh, the distortions that they use, idolaters, heathens, kafirs, whatever else, uh, it may be backwards, superstitious, uh, denigrations of various type are there <clears throat> and need to be challenged. But we also have to look at that root of aggression. They represent uh, civilizational models aiming at converting and conquering the world. And India has held out best against them. And perhaps they're afraid if India uh, survives, then the other countries in the world will revive their native traditions. Europe native traditions, pagan traditions are coming up, have a very long ways to go. South America, Mexico, they're coming up to some degree, but that movement needs to also be emphasized. And it's not just a question of the West versus Hindus. It's not even, a, it's a civilizational issue of, you we might say, uh, these kinds of dogmatic dichotomous ideologies against the uh, abundance, cultural abundance of the planet uh, overall. So in that regard, uh, the challenge has to be brought out at a civilization and cultural level, as well as uh, political, uh, economic, and uh, foreign policy. So we come down to the last question of the day. And the last question is, I think uh, this is the same person who asked the first part of the question. Okay, last question coming up. Okay, this is Shashank Dikshit about reservation system in India. Is it good or bad in long term? Will it ever end? Well, India does have the largest reservation system in the world for the longest period of time. Well, one could say given the size of the country, the need for economic development after independence, that perhaps it was necessary at least to uh, some degree. My main question about it is that it was defined too much along the lines of uh, social identities rather than across the board. In other words, helping a particular group, a particular identity, members of a particular religion, rather than just helping people who were poor or backward or improving education, improving economics overall. Because when you reward people for an identity, you strengthen that identity. And in India context, if you reward dozens of identities, uh, you have dozens of groups that are then competing for their identity rewards and looking at themselves in terms of a limited social identity rather than the broader interest of raising the 
the country as a whole. And because India was partitioned in the beginning based upon uh, a religious division, uh, you also then are kind of giving a sanction to almost every identity uh, affirmation or reward, and the national unity then gets uh, reduced. But certainly there needs to be equality, there needs to be help at an educational level, there needs to be skills for the poor, there needs to be protecting what is good in the village economy, eliminating what is bad. India has the largest agricultural sector percentage-wise by far of any country in the world. And in the long term, that's probably not sustainable. Uh, so it's not just a question of subsidizing the agricultural sector, but of renovating it, transforming it, or like other countries, getting people jobs outside of the agricultural sector, which is limited by the advances in the modern uh, technology. So that across the board approach I, is I think necessary and reservation based upon identity politics. I'm not saying it has no value, but it has to be approached very carefully. And as part of a national reintegration, cultural reintegration, rather than just simply uh, rewarding or giving one group benefits over uh, another group. And certainly there should be greater charity in the society by the rich and concern for not just simply government agendas, but for helping uh, people out in various levels of jobs, business, and a greater sense of uh, national unity and social welfare overall. So that brings us to the end of this uh, dialogue today. And um, you had the benefit of listening to some very enlightening ideas from Ji. Thank you very much, Ramdevji, and we'll keep bothering you like this. I think uh, the, the viewers oh. enjoy listening to you very much. It was uh, really mm -hmm. a wonderful session. Thank you so much.